before we start the last great senate, I thought we'd have a bit of a civics lesson, however, and just give you some backdrop on how the senate, uh, uh, what the senate is about, and, and, and that should help you, I think, with the interview when we talk about the senate and some of its operational aspects. So we're going to work with our friend the whiteboard here for a few minutes, and then we'll get right into the interview. So the Senate, I think for most of you know, uh, there are 100 senators in the U.S. Senate, and there are two from each state. Uh, from a historical perspective, this was a very important compromise that was made in the Constitutional Convention, where we have the House of Representatives that's based more on population, and there was, a, there was an agreement made to have a second body where each state would have equal representation. So again, each state has two senators, 50 states, 100 senators in total. Uh, another compromise that makes the Senate fairly unique is that each senator has a six-year term. So in the House of Representatives, the terms are two-year terms. Here the terms are six years, but they're broken up so that in each election cycle, one-third of the Senate is elected. So basically two years, two years, two years, and by the time you get through six years, you have um, a full Senate having been reelected. So again, six-year terms and one-third elected every two years. Now, because of these factors, the fact that there's 100 U.S. senators as opposed to 435 congressmen, six-year terms as opposed to two-year terms, and staggered election cycles, this all created what was hoped to be a deliberative body, a deliberative body and a body that could have unlimited debate. I think that's one of the most important parts of how the Senate is supposed to operate. It's supposed to slow things down a little, and it's supposed to be much more deliberative. There's 100 senators, so arguably... Each senator can have a meaningful role in that in debate, whereas if you have 435 uh, representatives to give everyone perhaps a meaningful role without limiting the time of the debate, you could have you know, ungodly long debates and maybe not get anything done. But with 100 senators, be more deliberative. Uh, that was, the, that was the, the tone they wanted to set for the Senate when the Senate was created. And because of that, they wanted to also offer up, and which has become very important historically, this notion of unlimited debate. However, uh, I think that's become a very controversial topic of late, um, how there is unlimited debate and how the adversarial side of the Senate, the side that's not in control, uh, the tools they use to extend out the debate and, from most people's perspective, get nothing done. That's, that's the downside to the unlimited debate, the fact that the minority can slow the system down so greatly that you end up with this, this dysfunctional result where nothing gets done. That plays out in, um, particularly in the news of late in another very unusual tool that the Senate has at their disposal, and that's the last dot point here. Uh, they have a unique authority of advice and consent. Uh, as part of the system of checks and balances, when the president makes an appointment or wants to, wants to enter into a treaty, the Senate is to give advice and consent on that treaty or on that nomination. And as I said, this is where things have gotten really bogged down. We have a judicial system where many of the nominees have not been considered, let alone voted on. Uh, we have treaties that often sit for a lot longer than people think uh, is necessary. But it's a tool that was given to the Senate, and it also you know, ties into this notion of deliberative. So there's a t natural tension between what's too deliberative and what is the right amount of deliberative. And as I said, there's tools being used today to kind of slow the whole process down and sometimes just use it to just break down the system entirely. And I think that's why uh, we want to focus on this book today, um, The Last Great Senate, and understand what it was like for a time when the Senate was considered to be very productive, very thoughtful, uh, very statesmanlike, and maybe a bit courageous, some of the things that we perhaps have lost now. So we're going to Take a quick break and come back with our segment and introduce Irish Shapiro and his book, The Last Great Senate.